We, we could take out our everything we do, our iPhones, pads, computers, outlines, Bibles. We could take all that out. As we get ready for the Jewish holidays, um, the end of August, growing up in a Jewish home was always exciting for us. Um, I don't know if it's the same on the East Coast as the West Coast, or if it's changed when I got a little older, but I always remember the excitement at the end of September, the excitement of the Jewish holidays. There was something different in the air. As my wife says, the air changed. She says it out here too, but I don't, you know, it doesn't seem like the air changes too much. But in the East Coast, there was just a different feel. As we got prepared for the Jewish holidays, we got prepared, uh, always uh, the sports people got prepared for uh, excitement of football and baseball coming to a conclusion and basketball and hockey, um, but especially the Jewish holidays. It was fun. And so uh, September this year signifies the Jewish holidays early. Um, it's one of the earliest I remember. Um, Rosh Hashanah is going to be, what is it, uh, not this Monday, next Monday night. I think it's next Monday night. Hanukkah, believe it or not, this year is not quite as early as it was a couple years ago. Some of you remember Thanksgiving uh, it was Thursday. I think Hanukkah was either Thursday or Friday night. This year, Hanukkah is Sunday night. So it's really close. Um, but why I'm talking about that, I have no idea. But Jewish holidays. Anyway, so the holidays were exciting. And uh, uh, we, we, we got ready for synagogue and, uh, and hearing different messages uh, for our, for our, in our congregation synagogues. I like the Jewish holidays. I like them especially... Uh, because I think they're so rich in meaning, all the Jewish holidays. And I think our people, my people that I share with, uh, recently I was telling you I went to Atlantic City to be with a friend I hadn't been with for 50 years, and, uh, uh, and I was with my whole Jewish community. The Jewish community does not know about the Jewish holidays. Uh, that's surprising to a lot of people. But the Jewish holidays... Are, they should be, everyone and everyone should be familiar with them. Jewish people are not familiar with them. They do know next, uh, actually now and throughout the week and next Sunday and Monday, they're going to say Happy New Year. But they're not sure what that means. They think it's the new year. It might be the new year. Uh, that we have a civil new year and a religious new year. Jewish people don't know which is which, but they say Happy New Year. Uh, a lot of believers don't know about the Jewish holidays, how they fit in, where they're uh, all about, what they're all about. But I think everyone should be familiar. They're so important because I think it's a special, special message that God has given to mankind, all of us, about all the Jewish holidays. I think the Jewish people that do not know Yeshua should be familiar with their holidays and how they develop. They don't know that. Believers in the churches, maybe in Messianic congregations, different places, believers are not familiar with the Jewish holidays. And the Jewish holidays are just so rich. And I like to always give an overview of the holidays, see how they all fit in, where Shabbat all fits in. Now, when I talk about the Jewish holidays, and I've told you this many times, you remember the Jewish holidays that God commanded the Jewish people. They are found in the book of, anyone? Leviticus chapter 23, God gives you the whole list of the holidays. There's uh, some people discerning should say, see there's two that are missing, Hanukkah and Purim, because they're not commanded by God. Hanukkah uh, was, uh, I don't know if it was commanded by the Maccabees, but it developed around the Maccabees time. I'm not sure who commanded us to observe that? I think Yeshua observed it. We know Purim was commanded for us, not commanded, but told for us to observe by Mordechai and lovely Queen Esther. Right. So we've been doing it ever since. So those, those are historical holidays. But the biblical holidays that God commanded us, and that's where people get uh, confused. If God commanded us, should we be doing them today? 
well, we can't really do them the way God suggested. We can't go to Israel three times a year like God told the Jewish leaders to be there. We can't follow all the sacrifices and all the, all the details. There are so many details in all the holidays. We can't do that. But we can observe them to some extent. We can recognize them. We can see what they mean, why God did give them to the Jewish people. And so what I like us to do is to go through those holidays. I like to do it once a year if possible, right before the holidays, seeing how they all fit in. So if you have your outlines, I want you to get, uh, fill them in so that next year you can come up here and you can do it. I'll pick one of you. Maybe not. Anyway, but what, I, what I'd like you to do is see the Jewish holidays. What is their purpose and what's their plan? So everyone fill it in. The Jewish feasts of Israel. Holidays, feasts of Israel. Oh, wrong I was up there. He said, that's my habit. Here it is. That's burnt out today. So, the feasts of Israel, and that would be Leviticus chapter 23, are God's prophetic plan. God gave the Jewish people these feasts. As I believe, prophecy predicting the, the current event, not the current events, the events of Israel throughout the nation, throughout the world. It's God's prophetic plan of what he's going to do for his people. It's laid out very, very systematic. They're just not random here and there. And most people just don't know how they fit in. Now, the way I love to fill it in, you could do it in a lot of different ways. Uh, you could just do feasts, one to seven. That, that's, that's one way. I could have seven points to do it. But I, I saw once where I liked where, um, I'm not sure where I first saw it, but the, someone divided it this way. They put the Shabbat right in the middle. The Shabbat, because that's the queen of all the holidays. That's the most important of all the holidays. A lot of people think it's Passover, some think it's Yom Kippur. Actually, the most important of all the Jewish holidays is Shabbat. And that's the queen of all the holidays. Shabbat, I put in the middle. Everything revolves around Shabbat. That's a little different than all the others. Then, I liked what uh, someone did. If you break it down, let's say, put Shabbat as Roman numeral one. Roman numeral two would be the uh, Messiah's first coming. The holidays associated with Yeshua's first appearance on the earth, his first coming to the earth, the first three holidays. Those first three holidays we call the spring feasts of Israel, three together. Then, that's, that would be Roman number two in your outlines. Roman numeral three would be the fall feasts. There would be the early feasts, the latter feasts. There's the early rain and the latter rain. The uh, Roman numeral three would be the fall feast or the Messiah's return, the second coming of the Messiah. And so that's how I like to think about the holidays. Shabbat, First three, Messiah's first coming. Second three, Messiah's return or his second coming. So the first thing we deal with is of all the, in, in Leviticus chapter 23, and God lays it out in order like that. Leviticus chapter 23, the first holiday we see is Shabbat. And so follow along Shabbat and its significance. We see it in Leviticus chapter 23 where we read, The Lord spoke again to Moses. Am I? Okay, good. The Lord spoke again to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, and say to them, The Lord's appointed times, which you shall proclaim as holy convocations. Here's God's appointed holidays for the nation of Israel. Uh, my appointed times are these. For six days, <coughs> work might be done. But on the seventh day, there is a Sabbath rest, complete rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no, uh, no work at all. It is a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwellings. This is just the reference, the first mention actually for Israel. It's mentioned before this, but up to this point, and a lot of people, this is very interesting, years ago when I first was studying this, Shabbat, Shabbat, a lot of people say, well, Shabbat goes all the way back to Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Well, yes and no. God says in Genesis 1 and 2, he created the heavens and the earth in six days, and on the seventh day, he rested. He sanctified, he set the day apart. Now, for so many times, for so long, so many people have told me, therefore, we should observe and rest Shabbat. There's no command to rest there. It's just an observance in Genesis 1 and 2. We don't find any commands there, not until thousands of years later when God made Israel a nation. Up to that point, God said he rested, and maybe, maybe the people should rest, but there was no commands to observe Shabbat. Now, you say, wait, 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 wait. He, he put it there. But is it interesting, before Israel, thousands of years before, after God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1 and 2, we don't find any command, no talk about the Sabbath at all after that. 
You know, a couple chapters later, a very, very important person in the scriptures, Noah. We don't see God speaking to Noah anything at all about Shabbat. We don't see God speaking to Job anything about Shabbat. Now this is, this is thousands and thousands of years before Israel. We don't see God speak to Abraham about Shabbat. We don't see God speak to Isaac about Shabbat. We don't see God speaking to Jacob about Shabbat. Not until Israel comes out of Egypt and God brings him out and he says, you're going to observe this special day. This day for Israel is a sign. I'm giving to Israel as a sign. You are to observe this day. It's a sign between the covenant and relationship I have with you, Israel. God made a special relationship with Israel and they were supposed to worship and observe Shabbat. Now, it is a good principle for the nations of the world, for everyone to take a day of rest. We see that principle. But we see Israel was actually commanded to. No commands before that, uh, before Israel was a nation. And God had made that clear. So what was Israel supposed to do? We're talking about now its, uh, its significance. What was Israel supposed to do on that day? On Shabbat, the nation of Israel, whether they were in the wilderness wanderings, although it's interesting, I was reading um, last week I think, in Joshua. In Joshua, God told Joshua to march around the city. Does anyone remember how many times? Seven. Not seven. How many? Thirteen total, but very good. Right? That's because you heard me. Before. Anyway, yeah, it's thirteen because God told Joshua, march around the city once, one day, the next day, once, six days. That's six. Then on the seventh day, march around seven times. So your total there should always remember, he told Joshua, march around the city 13 times. But I find it interesting that seven days. There is no day there for rest. They weren't observing Shabbat yet. You say, well, there had to be one, not, not one of those seven. If the seventh day was the Sabbath, they marched seven times. That was a lot of work. If the Sabbath was in between there, they're marching around once with the trumpets blasting and the priests. They're still marching around. So that, that, nothing to do with the message. But they weren't observing it yet. As, so now, once they're in the land, I believe God commanded them to observe it and he would punish them for it. What was Israel supposed to do on Shabbat? They were supposed to rest from their normal work. They were supposed to live in their tents, their homes, look up at the stars, and they were supposed to praise God. Good principle for all of us. Israel, if they didn't do it, they were punished. I don't believe we're punished if we don't. I think it's a good principle. I don't think we're bound to that. That was a law given to Israel while they're in the land, given specifically to Israel. And that was a sign of the covenant you have with them. We can observe a day like that. I think it's good. Now, just don't tell me uh, the Sabbath is Sunday. The Sabbath is never Sunday. It will never be Sunday. I don't care if you're, how many churches are in there and you say, no, our Sabbath is Sunday. Sabbath is not Sunday, folks. Sabbath starts when? Friday night at sundown, very good. And it goes till? Saturday night at sundown. And that never changed, it never will change. That is always Shabbat. Now you might not take that as your day of rest. Just don't call it a Sabbath. You might take a different day as your day of rest. Just don't call that day the Sabbath. That's not the Sabbath. That's your day of rest, but it's not the Sabbath. Israel is supposed to praise God. See the stars in the heaven. Stop from their normal work. They were supposed to also remember the creation account. They were supposed to remember the exodus as God brought them out of Egypt. Israel was supposed to uh, remember what God had done for them. We see actually, so is there a fulfillment? In your outlines, I have the fulfillment. Um, I believe, I believe the Sabbath will be fulfilled in the future. I do not believe we're bound to it today. I don't mind if you disagree with me. I give you permission to disagree with me. I see so many people love to come to Shuba. And they say, we come here because we want to observe Shabbat. And I say, great, great. So we want to keep Sabbath. I say, great, great. I don't think we're bound to keep Shabbat. But I do see in the scriptures a fulfillment of the, of the Sabbath. Sabbath was a time when the whole nation was to rest. And I believe the fulfillment of that will be in the future kingdom. When the whole world will rest. I think the Messiah is a picture of the Sabbath rest. In Yeshua, we have the completion of the Sabbath, I believe. Yeshua is our Sabbath rest. The kingdom with Yeshua, that's our Sabbath rest. 
we will cease from all our labors and all our work sometime in the future kingdom. That doesn't mean we're not going to work in the kingdom. It doesn't mean we're not going to do things. But in a sense, all the world will be at rest. All the world will be at peace. The fulfillment of that is seen in Yeshua, His return, and the kingdom. Now, in some sense, you want to make a little application. The Sabbath today, I do rest today from worrying about my salvation. I do rest today from working for my salvation. Someone says you want to go to heaven, you want to please God, you want to get into heaven. Well, you need to pray and read and work. Nonsense. You don't have to do anything to get into heaven except believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. I see on, as some of you know, January 15th, 1972, that'll never change. On January 15th, 1972, I ceased from all my work in getting into heaven. Did you know that? That night, I prayed and I asked Yeshua. I told you, Yeshua, I believe I'm a sinner. I believe Yeshua died for me. And I believe you came and died for me. And I put my trust in you. That moment, the Bible teaches me, I never had to work to get into heaven again. I was bound for heaven. My name was written in the book of life. I'm going to heaven. I cease from all my labor and all my work in getting into heaven. But does that mean I don't work now? Of course not. I work hard now. I work for the kingdom of God right now. And that will result in rewards when we get to heaven. So in some sense, I rest. Messiah is my rest. I rest today from my work, even though I do work uh, for, rewards and, uh, for rewards and getting to heaven. But I will have my rest. Follow along with me. Joshua hints at this. Uh, not Joshua. Uh, the writer to the book of Hebrews. He says, comparing it to Joshua. He says, for if Joshua, chapter 4, verse 8, if Joshua had given the Jewish people rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. Joshua brought the people into the land, but he still speaks of a future day of rest. That's the future kingdom, even though he brought them into the land. And it says, so there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Not today, folks. Although, I rest my work. That's good. You know, that's comforting. You don't have to worry about your salvation. Uh, You should serve, you should love him, you should do it, but you don't have to worry if you put your trust in Messiah. Now, if you haven't put your trust in Messiah, worry. Worry a lot if you haven't put your trust in Messiah. But uh, that's a side thing. Um, So, um, the future kingdom, Joshua speaks about a Sabbath rest. There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has rested, who has entered his rest, has himself also rested from his works, as God did from his. God rested. You and I, we rest from our work to get it into to salvation, to get into the, hev- the heavens. But therefore, it says, therefore today, since you have salvation, since you don't have to work for your salvation, since you're going to be in the future kingdom, therefore, he says, the writer says, work now. Not for salvation, but for God, uh, for rewards. Let's be diligent to enter into that rest. That means today, work, serve, love, do. So that no one will fall short through following the same example of disobedience. All right, I got sidetracked, I'm sorry. Everyone, middle, Roman numeral one, middle was called the what? Sabbath, very good. All right, next three holidays, Yeshua's first coming. They're fulfilled in Yeshua's first coming. The first and the most important holiday is Rosh Hashanah. And we'll follow along with me. Rosh Hashanah, we see Leviticus, we're just following Leviticus. um, Did I say Rosh Hashanah? Good. Wrong. Wrong. Tape. Wrong. Rewind. Back. Here we go. What that Willy Wonka? Didn't he do that? Rewind. Okay. Rosh Hashanah's wrong. First holiday. Over here. Passover. Okay. Now we're back on track. Oh yeah, that's recorded. Okay. The Feast of Passover is your first. The reference in Leviticus 23. I always say, you get up here. You try to do it. I like to see what, what comes out from there. But anyway, these are the appointed times of the Lord. Holy convocations. Proclaim them at the appointed times. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, at twilight, here it is. The first one is not Rosh Hashanah. It's called... Okay, you all said Rosh Hashanah. You were wrong. It's first Passover. Here we go. Okay. Um, in the first month uh, is, the twi- is the Lord's Passover. For seven days you should present an offering by fire to the Lord. On the seventh day of the holiday is a holy convocation. You shall do no work. Uh, God's reference 
found in the book of Leviticus 23. We see the first one really took place. Exodus chapter 12. We see where God commanded to the Jewish people and the account of it. Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month will be the beginning of all the months, the first of the year. Speak to all the congregation. Let me just stop and make it clear because I'm going to say it next week too. But the first month of the year for the Jewish calendar is what? Which month? Which holiday? Passover. So next week, when everyone is telling you Rosh Hashanah is the first month of the year, you will say? No. It's, do you know what month it is? Seven. Good. It's the seventh month. So why am I saying Rosh Hashanah? Uh, Rosh Hashanah. Happy New Year. To confuse you. No. You're saying Happy New Year because it's the civil New Year. The religious one starts first with Passover. That's the first of all the months. Even though Jewish people are celebrating Pas- uh, whew, uh, New Year's next week. God says on this month, the first of the month, on the tenth day of the month, you're at each one to take a lamb for yourselves and according to your father's household, a lamb for each one. Here's the command for God to tell Moses and the Jewish people when they came out of Egypt, celebrate this holiday. Your lamb shall be an unblemished lamb, year old, taken from the sheep or the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month, and everyone shall kill it at twilight. This is the command. This took place 3,500 years ago. The first of the Jewish holidays, Passover. It says, verse 7, Moreover, you will take some of the blood, put it on the doorpost, the upper portion, the lintel of your house. You shall eat the flesh that night, roast it with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. That's God's command. That's when we see it first takes place. 3,500 years ago, God gave it to the Jewish people in Egypt as they came out, the first of the months. They were supposed to sacrifice the lamb, put the blood on the doorpost, upper portion of the door, and God would pass over their house. We see what took place, the actual account, uh, chapter uh, Exodus 12, 29. Now it came about at midnight that the Lord struck the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh to the firstborn of the captive in the dungeon, the firstborn of the cattle. Pharaoh arose in the night, he and his servants in all e- Egypt, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not in any house someone who did not die. Then he called quickly, verse 31, to Moses and Aaron at night, Rise up, get out from among the people, both you and the sons of Israel, and go worship the Lord as you have said. The first of the Jewish holidays is the Passover lamb. What is the fulfillment of it? Now, we have it in the New Testament. We do know the fulfillment, which we're going to look at in a minute. But I like to go to the prediction of the fulfillment. God said, you know, was it the Passover lamb that, uh, where the Jewish people's blood was atoned for? Not at all. The Passover lamb was a picture of the real Passover lamb. We see that predicted, of course, in Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53 picture is the picture of the Messiah's death 700 years before it took place. But he would be pierced through for our transgressions. He would be crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. To me, I think me and many, many Jewish believers will sing and read and praise God for Isaiah 53 till we die and till we see the Lord again until we to the future kingdom. Isaiah 53, this chapter, has saved more Jewish people than any other, uh, any, any other portion, I think, in the scripture. Whenever you get a chance, you should share this with Jewish people. Isaiah 53 is the fulfillment, what will take place. Every Jewish person that reads Isaiah 53 Isaiah 53, if they haven't been already programmed by the rabbis, will say it's the Messiah. I certainly did believe that. And it says in verse 6, all of us are like sheep, we've gone astray. Each one has turned to his own way, and the Lord has caused the iniquity of all of us to fall on the Messiah. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that's led to the slaughter, and like sheep that's silent before his shears, so he did not open his mouth. If you can get a Jewish person to read this passage, they have to start thinking differently. Now, my good friend that I went back to Jersey on the beach of Atlantic City, I was able to share certain things with him, but not the full message. But I did say to him, I'm going to send you a book. And I'm taking advantage of you being my friend. You must read the book I send you. He said he would. I'm sending, and I recommend to people, if they're going to read a book, 
to take the book Betrayed. It's the story of a Jewish businessman. His daughter came home. His daughter said she believed in Jesus. I don't think she said Yeshua. She said Jesus. And he felt betrayed. And the whole book is his investigation. And he gets into Isaiah 53. Probably the most effective book to reach Jewish people. And so you should pray as I send that book out with a few other things to my friend. Isaiah 53 predicts the uh, death of the Messiah. First Jewish holiday. It's the one word for the Jewish holiday of Passover is redemption. Yeshua would die, his blood would be shed, and he would redeem the world. We find the application in the New Covenant. 1 Corinthians 5. Clean out the old leaven. Now, Rabbi Saul is making an illustration. He knows to his Jewish audience that he's writing to in Corinth, he knows that on Passover, what did they do for a month before Passover? They cleaned out the leaven. That's what Jewish people do. Today, they clean the leaven. They don't even know why or what, but they clean out the leaven in their homes. And so this rabbi, he's telling the Jewish people, just like you clean out the leaven in your homes for Passover. They would know what he was speaking about. He said, clean out the old leaven so that you might be a new lump, just as in fact you are unleavened. For the Messiah, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. He's the Passover lamb. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with the old leaven, with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I believe what Rabbi Saul is telling us, really, that if you're a believer and you've accepted Messiah, clean up your life. Change your life. You're already, in fact, unleavened because Messiah has made you clean. But you live and you make mistakes all the time. Clean out your, your life now. Live pure, focused, holy, godly, spiritual, serving God today. Confessing your wrong. Because you are truly saved and forgiven. But now, because you do wrong, clean out that leaven. That's what I think he's making the application. Everyone, first of the Jewish holidays, forget Passover, uh, forget Shabbat. First of the Jewish holidays is? Second, anyone? Three days later. To me, the most important of all the Jewish holidays. Really is the most important, really. If you just have Passover, death of Messiah, it's not enough without the next Jewish holiday. The next Jewish holiday is the holiday, what we call first fruits, or, or you, uh, you write it down, first fruits, or what I like to say is the resurrection of Messiah. Passover, one word would be redemption. Second holiday is first fruits. This is what we call the resurrection. We see the reference, Leviticus 23. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to Israel. When you enter the land, which I'm giving to you, you reap its harvest, then you shall bring in the sheep of the first fruits of your harvest um, to the priest. He shall wave the offering before the Lord to be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. All that's to say this. On Passover week, after Shabbat, the next day, they were supposed to take the, the, the first fruits of the wheat, the barley harvest, the first fruits of them, and wave it before God. That's a special offering. That's all it says there. What was the meaning of that? The first fruits. What God was telling the Jewish people, take the first fruits of the future harvest. Now, a few weeks from now, we're going to have a harvest. God says, take the first fruits and wave it before me. What I'm telling you is this first fruit is a guarantee. This is my pledge to you Jewish people that though you took the first fruits, there's coming a harvest in the future. This is called the first fruits holiday. The fulfillment of it, the Bible, the, the Bible tells us the fulfillment. And he says um, in 1 Corinthians 15, if the Messiah has not been raised, then our preaching is vain, your faith is also vain. And if Messiah has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. But now the Messiah has been raised from the dead, the He's the first fruits. The Jewish holiday of first fruits was a guarantee of the future harvest. The fulfillment of that, first the death of the Messiah, the resurrection of the Messiah, he is the guarantee that there's going to be a harvest in the future. Because he's been raised, you and I will be raised. Because he's been raised, we know for certain we have a place in the kingdom. He is the first fruits. He's my guarantee. And the writer, of course, the Rabbi Saul, is saying here, if he's not been raised, you're foolish people. You believe a lie. But 
Messiah is the first fruits of those who will be raised. We will be raised. The holiday, this holiday, is what the world uses, the, you know, the E word, which we don't even say. Uh, but it's the resurrection, the holiday of first fruits. And he's saying here, uh, now the Messiah has been raised, the first fruits of those who are asleep, all those who've died. For by a man came death, by a man also comes the resurrection. For in Adam all die, so in the Messiah all will be made alive. Yeshua is our first fruits. But each in his order. The Messiah, the first fruits. After those the, uh, who are Messiahs at his coming. Then the end comes. So, Messiah's been raised. And then we know sometime in the future, because he's been raised, you and I will be raised. That'll be, if it happens today, we'll be raised. He's going to raise all of us uh, at the resurrection. Or first, I believe, at the rapture. But God will raise us. That's our guarantee. 1 Corinthians tells we have that guarantee. Then comes the end, but everyone in its proper order. The holiday of first fruits is our guarantee. That's our assurance that we will be raised. Third holiday, Passover is the death of Messiah. One word, redemption. Second holiday, first fruits or resurrection. Or, for some of you pagans, it's Easter. Oh, don't say that here. No, 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 okay. That's for pagans, but anyway. But I said that just to let you know which one it is, just in case someone was wondering. Is it really? It's that one. First fruits or resurrection? That's the Passover. The next one is first fruits or resurrection. But there's a third Jewish holiday, all fulfilled in Messiah's first coming. Third of the Jewish holiday is a holiday we call Pen is it Pentecost? Pentecost. Or. Thank you. Okay. They're all the same. Okay. Third of the Jewish holiday has three names. Feast of Weeks, uh, Shavuot, which means seven, or Pentecost, which means 50. How, what does seven have to do with 50? Seven times seven, seven weeks. On the next day, the 50th, uh, would be the holiday of Pentecost. That's the third. The reference is found in Leviticus 23. You shall count for yourselves after the day of the Sabbath, that was during Passover week, from the day you bring in the sheep of the wave offering, there shall be seven complete Sabbaths, 49 days. You shall count 50 to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you present a new, always an offering to the Lord. This is the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Harvest. God gave the harvest. God gave the blessing. God gave the rain. God gives something. Passover. Uh, Passover, redemption. Um, resurrection, first fruits. Fifty days later, God gave the Jewish people the Spirit of God, or first, He gave them what we see, the law. In the account, look with me in uh, Exodus 19. On the Jewish holiday, it says, On the third month, after the sons of Israel had gone out of Egypt, on the very day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. Most Jewish scholars believe this was fifty days after Passover after they came out of Egypt. Third month, you can figure it out. Passover was the 15th of the first month, then 30 days, that's a Jewish month, second month, and probably another couple days in the third month. In the third month, which is probably the 50th day, Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the sons of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on my yeah, bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. <clears throat> Verse 5. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples of the earth, for, uh, for all the earth is mine. You shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words which the Lord had commanded him. Most scholars, most people believe that God gave the Jewish people his law on the probably the 50th day of this holiday. It's the fulfillment when God blessed the Jewish people. Chapter 19, verse 8. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. God led them and gave them his law. Passover, redemption. First fruits, resurrection. Seven weeks later to the 50th day, God gave the Jewish people his law to guide them, direct them, and lead them as a nation. 
Well, that we see is the fulfillment of that in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Now, 1,500 years after that is when we see the fulfillment of this. Acts chapter 2. We know, actually from Acts chapter 1, that Yeshua appeared to the disciples for 40 days. About 11 different appearances. Then Acts chapter 1 tells us, on the Mount of Olives, it's very clear here, on the Mount of Olives, on the 40th day, 40 days after his resurrection, 40th day, he spoke to them. He told them, not for you to know the times, the seasons, uh, when God said in his own, he says, but 40 days later, Yeshua said, but you shall be my witnesses. You shall receive power. And you know what happened on the 40th day, everyone? What? He went up. But he told the people, I'm going. You, wait. And I always say, you know, if I was down there, wait. For what? Wait. For how long? Wait. Scripture tells us how long to wait. Acts chapter 2. They were to wait 10 days. I probably would have been patient all those 10 days saying, what are we waiting for? How long do we have to be here? Anyway, some with insight would have said, maybe the 50th day is important. That's when God gave the law. Maybe God's going to do something on the 50th day. And it says, Acts 2, when the day of Pentecost, Shavuos, Feast of Weeks came, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, filled the house, and there appeared to them tongues of fire distributing themselves. And they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And he began to, they began to speak in other languages as the Spirit was giving them utterance. God sent forth his Spirit. Messiah's first coming fulfills the first three Jewish holidays. Passover is redemption. First fruits, resurrection. Pentecost, Shavuot, the giving of God's law, the giving of God's Holy Spirit. Now in the scriptures, actually in the scriptures we don't see it, but in life we see a long period. We don't know. Now it's been 2,000 years. The next three Jewish holidays will be fulfilled next week, uh, sometime in the future. The next three Jewish holidays that are coming. We see that in uh, Leviticus chapter 23. The next holiday, actually, even before you see that holiday, I uh, wanted you to just see the fulfillment of the, of, uh, the, the holiday of Pentecost in uh, Ezekiel chapter 36. Moreover, God says for the nation of Israel, I will put a new heart and a new spirit in you, and, our, and you, I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you. God gave his spirit on the day of Pentecost. In the future, God's going to give his spirit to the nation of Israel. There's an application for all of us in those first three holidays. The first holiday for me was fulfilled January 15th, 1972. I accepted Messiah. I was given new life, holiday of first fruits. He gave me his Holy Spirit. To all people today who put their trust in Messiah, he gives the Holy Spirit. I remember once saying that, and some person said to me, you mean I don't have the Holy Spirit? I said, no, you don't. They didn't like that. I said, but you can receive the Holy Spirit if you put your trust in Messiah. First three holidays. The next three holidays will be fulfilled at Yeshua's second coming. Follow along with me, the fourth. These I'm going to summarize more because we're going to do them next week. So, the fourth of the Jewish holidays, and if you're making your outline, this is now Roman numeral three. The Jewish holiday, the next holiday is Rosh Hashanah, or the head of the year. God speaks about it in Leviticus 23. He says, Again the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel in the seventh month, in the first of the month, you shall have a rest, a reminder, by blowing the trumpets, a holy convocation. Now, that's all it says about Rosh Hashanah. I, I'd like it to say more about it. Rosh Hashanah just tells us, God is going to blow the trumpet. Well, that's all he's going to say in Leviticus 23. But when you blow the trumpets in the scripture, there's a few things you should write down. The blowing of the trumpets, God told Joshua, the first time you blow the trumpets, certain tribes gather together. Blow the trumpet a second time, the other tribes come together. Blow a trumpet again, you all go back home. The blowing of the trumpet is the regathering 
of our Jewish people. That's always the picture. When you write down Rosh Hashanah, the fulfillment of it, I'd like you to say, it's one of two words, regathering or return. God bringing our people back. Now I'm going to add a few words next week. When you hear the trumpets, you are, the Bible also says, rejoice. We should rejoice when we hear the trumpet blast. We should also, the Bible says, when you hear the trumpet blast, you should repent and turn back to God and man. When you hear the trumpet next week, you should remember that God remembers you. God remember. He says, you blow the trumpet, that'll signal God to remember who you are. Rosh Hashanah speaks of all these. But I want you to realize the fulfillment of Rosh Hashanah is the regathering of our people. I told you the first three. The next three of, the, of these holidays, when Messiah comes back, the trumpet will blast. I believe the fulfillment of that is found in Isaiah chapter 27. In that day, the Lord says, uh, he will start his threshing from the flowing streams of the Euphrates to the brook of Egypt, and you will be gathered up the nation of Israel, in the future, one by one, um, O sons of Israel. It will come about in that day that there will be a great trumpet blown. I believe that's the Rosh Hashanah trumpet. I believe that. God will sound the trumpet and he will officially draw his people back into the land of Israel. I think he's been doing it for about 100, 200 years. But I think there'll be an official beginning when that trumpet will blast when God will officially gather his people back to the land of Israel for a specific purpose, which I'll get to in a minute. He says, and I'll bring them back from the land of Assyria where they were scattered uh, in the land of Egypt and they will come and worship the Lord in the holy mountain. I believe the fulfillment of Rosh Hashanah is sometime over here in the future when God will officially gather Israel back to the land. But I think there's a second fulfillment, not a second fulfillment, an application fulfillment as well. When that trumpet blasts, Rosh Hashanah, God gathers his people together. But God has at least two groups of people. Israel, be back in the land, but the body of Messiah. You know, everyone, what's this? The right bubble. When that trumpet blasts, you and I, we're going up. When that trumpet blasts, I know there's a lot of controversy. I see I a, I'm a part of a rabbi's forum. Uh, and for the Messianic Jewish Alliance, and there's a rabbi, and they're all talking about it for the last two weeks. That's all they talk about. When is the rapture? And they're all buzzing back and forth, and they're talking, and I'm sitting there, and they say, Can you put down if you are pre, mid, or post? And all the rabbis say, I think it's this, 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 this. And so I don't speak too much on the rabbis' forums. So anyway, but last week they saw Larry Feldman speak, pre. That's all I said. No discussion at all. It's pre. Um, that's what I believe. That's when God's trumpet will blast and he will draw us together. We see the fulfillment in Levitic, uh, 1 Thessalonians. Great rabbi says it this way. I don't want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are died, sleep, so that you, uh, that you grieve as the rest who have no hope. But if we believe that Yeshua died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Yeshua. For we say by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain in the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the... I believe that trumpet is the same trumpet as in Isaiah 27. The trumpet will blast. God gathers his people back to the land for the tribulation period, and God gathers the believers to be with him in the clouds, to be with him forever, it says. We'll be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Fourth holiday, Rosh Hashanah, gathering of his people to the land of Israel. What for? God will now cleanse his people. The next Jewish holiday, Yom Kippur, when he cleanses them, he's drawn them back to the land of Israel. He will purge them and purify them and make them pure. That's what he says to do. That's the, many people get Yom Kippur confused when they talk about Yom Kippur because the word Kippur is atonement. The atonement was fulfilled on the first holiday, which is Passover. This holiday of Yom Kippur, the word you want to write down is cleansing. God will cleanse the nation of Israel. 
That's when he draws them back to land. And that's a tribulation period, when God will cleanse the nation. Uh, the key to that is the, the cleansing of the nation. Ezekiel 36. For I will take you from all the nations, gather you from all the lands, bring you into your own land, which he's done. Then I will, or officially, Rosh Hashanah, the trumpet. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you. That's Yom Kippur, when he cleanses the nation of Israel. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and all your idols. We don't have time to turn to it, but as Zechariah 13, God says when the Messiah comes back, he will cleanse the nation of Israel, 13.1. He'll be, bring a fountain of cleansing for the nation of Israel. Jeremiah 31 says he will forgive them for all their sins. God will cleanse the nation of Israel, the holiday of Yom Kippur. I think there's an application for us as well, and it's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If you remember, I said Rosh Hashanah, he gathers the Jewish people to the Lamb. He cleanses them for Yom Kippur. Rosh Hashanah, God will gather us to be with him at the rapture. We will face him, and he will cleanse us. And that's what we see our rewards. He will cleanse us from all our, our sin. It says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of the Messiah. That's at the rapture. So that each one may be recompensed for the deeds done in his body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. When we stand before him, he will judge you and me, not for our sin, but the way we served him. And we will receive our rewards. That's the cleansing for the nation. We finally get to the last one. There is Passover, redemption. First fruits, resurrection. Shavuot, Pentecost, God's giving of the law, God's giving of the spirit. Time right now going on, the blasting of the trumpet, Rosh Hashanah. God gathers his people. Yom Kippur, he cleanses his people. And then the last of the Jewish holidays. He's gathered them, he's cleansed them, and you know what now? He lives with us. He dwells with us. That's the holiday of tabernacles. Or Sukkot, which means dwelling. Messiah comes back to dwell with his people on the earth. The holiday is found, uh, the Sukkot, um, Leviticus 23. Speak to the sons of Israel on the 15th of the seventh month. Is the Feast of Booths, Tabernacle, Sukkot. Uh, for seven days. You shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall live in booths, tents, for seven days. All the native in Israel will live in booths so that your generations may know that I have the sons of Israel live in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. So coat is a picture when God brought the Jewish people out of Egypt and he lived with them. I always loved that picture. As God dwelt with them in the wilderness. So God will dwell with his people in the future kingdom. You and I, as the right bubble, the body of Messiah, we're married to Yeshua. We will dwell in Israel with the Jewish people 4,000 years in the future kingdom. That's the holiday of Sukkot. And we see it will be observed, Zechariah 14. In that day... His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. I haven't been there in two years now. I really. There's one thing, I mean, there's a lot of things in Israel. Israel's work. Israel is, uh, uh, it's not convenient like we have here, convenience. But there's one thing I love. Standing on the Mount of Olives. That is really, really cool. I love sharing this verse. On the Mount of Olives. It is just so cool to stand on that mountain. And to look west and you see the mount, you see the dome of the rock, and you see the mount where the temple mount was. You're standing on the Mount of Olives where Yeshua came 2,000 years ago, where he rode down that, that uh, Palm Shabbat uh, road where we walked down there. And he, stand, and, he's, and he left and he's coming back. Standing on the Mount of Olives. His feet will stand there someday. You and I will stand there with him. And it says, in that day, He'll stand there, which is in front of Jerusalem, on the east. I said west. No, the Mount of Olives is on the east, and you look west to the temple. And it says, it will be split in half, large valley, half of the mountain will move to the north, half to the south. Then it will come about that all who are left of the nations that went up to Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, to celebrate Feast of Booths. 
Feast of Booths. So therefore, because we have Passover, redemption, because we have first fruits, resurrection, because we have Pentecost, or Shavuot, God gave us spirit. Because the Messiah is coming back, gathering his people to the land of Israel, gathering the believers to be with him. Because he's going to cleanse the nation of Israel. Because he will dwell with his people in the future. Therefore, there's two groups of people in the world. What should we do? Believers, we're called to live holy, godly, spiritual lives for him. There, Peter says, therefore, what kind of people should you be? Holy in, in all your conduct, in all your behavior. We are called because it's going to happen. Yeshua is coming back. We will look upon him. I was listening to Michael Verdelnik this morning on the radio, uh, that uh, Moody Bible thing, and he, he says he wants to stand before the Lord. They were talking about rewards and all kinds of rewards that they wanted to have. And Michael said, there's really just one thing, only one thing. It's true that I want or you want. We just want the Lord to look at us, don't you? And say, well done. Right. Because he's coming back, you should be serving him now. Reading, praying, worshiping, obeying, serving, giving, sharing. Because he's coming back. You want him to say, well done. The other group of people are those who are not in this bubble. They've never put their trust in Messiah. Because for certain he's coming back, now's the time. Right now. While you're looking, if you don't know Messiah. Now's the time you say to God, God, I believe I've sinned against you. I believe you cared so much for me. You loved me so much. You sent Yeshua, the Messiah, to die for me. I now want to receive Messiah into my heart and my life to be my Messiah and Savior. Very simple. Three things. You've sinned. God sent the Messiah. You put your trust in Him. Father God, because You're coming back, You're sending Your Messiah, Your Son, our Messiah and Savior. What kind of people should we be? Believers should worship You and love You and serve You. Non-believers today shouldn't waste another day, but today should be the day they pray. Tell God they've sinned, that Yeshua died for them. They want to receive him into their heart and life. We commit this time to you and thank you for it in Yeshua's name. Amen.